Hello, Brian Weigel here. In this video, we'll ask the question, how were societies organized and explore the concept of social archeology? span We'll be reviewing the text by Renfro and Bonn, chapter five, Archeology span Essentials. Archeologists often try to ask questions about the nature and in particular the scale of past human societies. So using the material record, the artifact record, trying to answer questions about social organization, how societies were organized and how they changed through time. So we have expanded and updated on the classification system presented by Illman Service um, to organize different societies into three or four major categories. And we'll review those categories in this video. We'll also talk about how questions of gender roles and identity in past societies may be manifest in the archeological record. So archeology span is part of anthropology and cultural anthropology asks very similar questions of contemporary societies around the world. And they do this through participant observation and ethnographic work to interview living people uh, as a way to research social and power structures, also gender identity, religion, economic relationships, and a whole range of other culturally significant aspects of life and differences, cultural diversity around the world. Archaeology asks very similar questions, but often uh, we don't have the opportunity to interview the people of the societies that we study. In some cases, we can glean light through uh, ethno ethnographic approaches, um, es especially um, interviewing existing hunting and gathering societies um, through a method known as ethnoarchaeology. But for the vast majority of archaeological research, um, there's nobody left to interview. So archaeology is often reliant on just the material culture. Um, this, as example, uh, is true of the Paleolithic period where the majority of the world was uh, living in a band level hunter gatherer type of social organization. Now there would have been cultural varieties from place to place and region to region, uh, but for the most part societies were small scale and highly mobile focused on hunting and collecting. So that material culture is very different than say an early state level society uh, where people came together in larger conglomerates, formed denser urban areas and centralized forms of government. So different questions and methods may apply uh, from a researcher working on a paleolithic site from those working on the formation of state level societies. So to classify societies, we have expanded Elman Service's four major categories, and we can talk about uh, mobile hunter-gatherer groups or segmentary societies, um, used to be referred to as tribal level societies, um, to the centralized forms of government, chiefdoms, and states. So in this table, the two left columns, hunter-gatherers and segmentary societies, could be considered as uncentralized or decentralized forms of government, while the left two columns, chiefdoms and state, have centralized forms of government and uh, a bureaucracy which administers um, the social order and social organization, often led by either a king or a chief, in some cases president, somebody at the top of the social order. Uh, but these centralized forms also are stratified, uh, meaning there is a social hierarchy within their social organization. Um, there are wealthy elite and uh, poor farming and in some cases slave classes um, in a highly stratified society. They also tend to have centralized forms of government also tend to have large scale monumental structures, works of uh, public works projects, temples, 
or monuments, say the Stonehenge as an early form in Neolithic and late Neolithic um, England, or the temples of the Great Pyramids at the Giza Plateau or at Chichen Itza in Mexico, temple structures that are constructed. So we're talking about um, state chiefdoms, tribal levels, and hunter-gatherer bands um, as different classifications of society. Different methods that apply to the analysis of, of society um, and a few key concepts to take away. Um, we're looking at settlement analyses and site hierarchies, the numbers of sites on the landscape that are associated with each other, um, how they're connected, uh, the size and scale of those sites helps to determine the intensity and density of a population at a time. Burial analysis, especially of cemeteries, can really provide um, evidence about social hierarchy, social ranking, uh, because people tend to be interned with material goods and you'll get a snapshot of a population over time by looking at the degree of material culture or wealth, prestige items that may or may not be buried with an individual in a cemetery. So that helps you see the population uh, level, social ranking and hierarchies. Uh, we can look at the evolution and development of monuments and public works, and then and the initial appearance of written records, which can record daily aspects and business exchanges from society uh, at the time. And with written records, you have the appearance of history. So the material culture is supplemented by the written account, although it should be noted that um, not everything that people have put in writing is an accurate reflection of what is happening in that society. Um, it, people may um, exaggerate um, or inflate written accounts and written accounts tend to represent the perspective of those in power and those in control and very rarely represents the perspective of um, lower classes that may be illiterate or unable to produce written accounts of their own. Uh, finally, we'll review a concept developed by Lewis Binford, uh, ethnoarchaeology, which combines ethnography with archaeological practice to better inform um, and help to remove researcher bias from the interpretation of the archaeological record. So artifact distribution, especially for hunter-gatherer sites, paleolithic or prehistoric, um, pre-state level sites is important. Here you can see maps of bone or fauna um, from Kubaifora, Kenya, as well as stones and refed analyses, spatial distributions, um, to uh, try to get at activity areas, um, areas where artifact density is increased, um, and to interpret different activities that had gone on at this location, uh, which was occupied by Paleolithic hunter-gatherers. Um, so refitting and spatial analysis, activity areas, density, and scale of artifact distribution is important. Uh, another look at uh, artifact distribution. This was a model developed by Robert Foley on hunter-gatherers where he, um, on a larger scale than the Kubaifora example, uh, mapped out hunter-gatherer range, home base activity areas, um, resource extraction zones, um, association of temporary camps to more permanent camps, fuel sources, gathering areas, hunting locations. And if you take all of that information away, you see on the right hand of this panel, the distribution of artifacts that can help show activities that had occurred uh, in this area uh, by a group of band level hunter gatherers uh, based on the scatter of artifacts. Here's a house plan map of a, a house feature from uh, Tierras Largos uh, that dates to about 900 BC. So here you see features and artifacts mapped together post molds, um, ash areas where there were um, fire pits, bell-shaped storage pits dug into the ground, and the distribution of various artifacts that represent perhaps activity areas, um, uh, as well as a trash dump 
outside of the house. So here we can look at people's use of space internally uh, and analyze the scale of that society on a household level. It helps us see economic activities and a domestic use of space, giving us a more intimate look at the daily lives of people uh, about 900 BC, roughly 3,000 years ago. Here's a regional spatial analysis from the Mississippian cultural uh, period over 500 years ago, where sediments, settlements have changed through time. So we need our strong, robust chronological order here so that we can look at slices of time and changes of site distribution over that time. Uh, in this case, over 3,000 burials were analyzed so that uh, ranked society could be determined. This is um, a society without writing, but we can determine that they had been developing social hierarchy or social stratification uh, in this society as time went along. It was probably ruled by a powerful chief at one point as people uh, began to uh, organize. Uh, and if we take a closer look at that society, this pyramid shows us through the analysis of those 3,000 burials um, that some people were buried with mound features. Mounds are earthen works that are built up um, for burials. There's a variety of different grave goods in those burials. And we see a very highly ranked society where copper axes appear at the very top in burials of what we might call the social elite of the society. Um, and then some tiers below that where copper uh, begins to drop off. Shell beads, um, galena, which is a very shiny material um, in the middle of society, a middle class. Um, people were buried without mounds, but they still had some burial goods of effigy vessels, animal bone, um, and shell. Uh, tools, various projectile points and tools they may need in the afterlife. And at the very bottom, there's about 1,250 burials that have no grave goods, no mounds at all. And that's the majority of the population. And so you start to see a pyramid structure appear in a ranked society where in some cases, the vast majority of the people are at the bottom and a very few minority are at the top. So we get a picture of how social hierarchy develops in human societies. The vast majority of human prehistory on this planet, we have lived as egalitarian hunters and gatherers where there's very little social hierarchy among um, our groups. Our societies were smaller in scale. They had decentralized forms of government with no coercive authority and no police forces. It is only around um, the development of agriculture, the Neolithic period, and eventually as um, food production and storage increased, uh, eventually around 5,000 years ago, we begin to see the first urban centers. But social hierarchy begins to, to show uh, initial signs uh, in the late Paleolithic period where there are a few burials around uh, in Europe, uh, in Eurasia, where certain individuals have a higher number of pr um, prestige goods. So uh, Sungir in Russia, for example, individuals were, build, were buried with thousands of beads and that was unusual uh, for the period. So uh, in Indonesia, for example, at Kok, Phantom D, a Bangkok cemetery, there's a princess buried among hundreds of individuals in a cemetery who had 120,000 beads with her, a headdress, bracelets, very fine pottery, and the other burials didn't have those items. So it suggested that she had some means and wealth in life and the ability to have her uh, family and close um, connections um, put those valuable objects in, objects in the ground with her, interred with her. So it suggests social hierarchy um, in these early state level societies. In Central America, Oaxaca, Mexico, we can look at monuments and public works um, where an early Zapotec state 
built temples and public places, a temple economy had emerged, a centralized place where economic activities uh, were driven. Central Plaza represents a public space where commerce and ceremonies can um, take place. It represents an early form of a centralized form of government and a bureaucratic administration. In Neolithic England, um, we see a shift from um, a decentralized Neolithic early farming and hamlet structure here where there are regions or collections of Neolithic farmers who are now producing and, and storing food um, shift to a more centralized form of government when early monuments began to appear, megalithic um, structures like the Stonehenge. So causeways, uh, essentially roads that move people towards these centralized places, social landscapes begin to be uh, emerging and interpreted by burials and monuments and other aspects of archaeological sites. Um, we see small farming communities on the left where there's no one central dominant group and then monuments begin to emerge in the basis of early forms of centralization around a religion or um, astronomy to predict and help determine the planting and harvest seasons uh, and it highlights this transition to a centralized form of government. And during this period, somebody has to emerge as in the late Paleolithic as the organizer of the labor. People have to come together as a community and agree on specific social norms and uh, dedicate man hours, human hours, to the construction of these monuments. So here we can approximate the number of work hours that were required for the construction of the Stonehenge. And it's on the order of 30 million man hours or people hours uh, invested into this construction. So this implies early level social hierarchy and ranking within society as somebody must be in charge or you probably were supervisors and someone engineering or directing all of this activity. It implies an early form of hierarchy had developed. Written records give us an excellent example of business and commerce. Um, these tablets are from the Royal Palace of Elba in Syria and date to 5,000 years ago. Um, there are also 5,000 clay tablets here. So one for every year that had passed um, since 3000 BC, roughly. They represent a state archive of record keeping and offer greater insight and clues into the mindset and the social organization of that society. It shows highly regulated bureaucratic operations and record keeping, transactions, business, the flow of goods, and a centralization of their administration. In South America, an early state level society, the Inca uh, had emerged. They built monuments, they had centralized form of government under a highly ranked social system um, beneath a powerful, powerful emperor uh, and a major road or causeway that linked an ex a, a vast and extensive network of that empire. They did not have a written system. One of very few um, complex society with a centralized form of government that operated without a written account. They did have this complicated kipu system, which is a series of woolen strings that are um, tied together and knots are tied at different lengths along those um, strings and worked as a system uh, a mnemonic device where runners could move between the centers of power up and down the road and deliver administrative directives and um, notes 
the, uh, to uh, the various regions of the empire. And so a very elaborate system that we have not um, deciphered yet. We can't read a kipu and, and tell people what it says. Law codes began to emerge in the early states of Southwest Asia, um, particularly the city-states uh, in 1750 BC in Babylon. The famous Hammurabi Code was um, published on this um, stella carved into stone, and it gave a system of laws. It codified the expected behavior within society and um, also publicly displayed the punishments for breaking those codes. So uh, we see the emergence of state authority, the ownership and authentic authenticity of power structures within society. You also see the administration of society and regulations. Um, similarly, in the Akkadian Empire, a cylinder seal that dates to 2400 BC, these seals go uh, further back in time into the Sumerian period of Mesopotamia. Um, and you see cuneiform written on this clay seal, which represents and presents the structures of power and documents systems of trade for archaeologists to read today and, de and determine um, what the social organization of that, those past societies work. Lewis Binford developed a, a method called ethno-archaeology where he went to Anatovic Pass in Alaska and lived with Inuit um, for a period where he participated in hunting activities because he wanted to better understand hunter-gatherers in cold environments. His initial intention was to better interpret Neolith or, um, Neanderthal activities in Europe because they were a cold adapted hunter-gatherer paleolithic um, social organization. He thought living with Inuit would give him better insight um, even though we're talking about potentially different species and worlds and, and tens of thousands of years difference between them. Uh, he as a white European had little concept of what it was to be a hunter gatherer outside of what he had studied in textbooks. Um, so to go out and sit around a hearth, make tools and hunt uh, would have been somewhat foreign to him. And to his credit, he went out and participated in these activities so he could get a better sense of artifact distributions around an archeological hearth feature. So he um, wrote a paper about the mask site among the Nunumut in Alaska. He discovered drop and toss zones where people dropped smaller art artifacts in front of them when they're sitting around a hearth and tossed larger artifacts over their shoulders. And the distribution of these items around a hearth feature were very telling of the activities that went on, some of which he generalized to human populations um, in, in a very broad sense. Um, so he was studying existing hunting and gather, gathering societies to better understand prehistoric activities where there was no written account. So in this case, participant observation informed his archeological interpretation. In some cases, when we're studying social organization and the hierarchy or social rankings, um, we can learn about individuals and we can learn about societies as a whole, um, the identity of people and how they identify in some cases. Other cases that can be very difficult. Um, one question archeologists focus on is social inequality, the emergence of social stratification and hierarchy, is it possible to have a complex state level society that does not have inequality, um, does not have haves or have nots, or rich, poor people? Is that a possibility? Has there ever been such a society? Maybe the closest example we have comes from the Harappan civilization along the Indus, um, which emerged um, as an early state society in Southern Asia where there is little evidence of 
social hierarchy. Probably not a completely egalitarian society, but uh, maybe as close as we could get to an egalitarian state. So archaeologists often investigate gender roles. Um, gender roles go back to the Paleolithic where you may have had man the hunter and woman the gatherer. But as far as economic specialization, um, that's about it. Um, children played an important role in the economy and adults did, but the division of labor w wasn't much more complex than that. And of course, women provided the majority of the food for the societies in many cases, and children and women also engaged in hunting as well. Um, so that's not even a very uh, complete or strict um, division of labor in most hunting and gathering societies. So we can investigate these divisions of labor, economic specialization as societies developed more complex and centralized forms, the division of labor and economic specialization becomes more intricate, more interconnected, and there's greater diversity. This leads to social stratification. One example is the excavation of a brothel and five points in uh, Manhattan, um, a, a, a cellar of a 19th century, century brothel was investigated um, to better understand uh, lower status individuals. What were life, what was life like for prostitutes of the 18th century? Um, we know that they owned fine china, even though they were among a poorer class uh, within that hierarchy of sites. This is not unusual. We see um, wealthy elite who will gift fine wares to, um, in this case, must have been prostitutes, um, but also slaves. So, um, you know, the house slaves were often given fine china um, as a gift uh, when um, the house masters replaced their china um, and got the newest, latest trend. Um, so we do see some examples of what we might call prestigious artifacts or prestige wear appearing in contexts that we might not expect them to. Uh, but this helps to show the relationship of power and dominance in um, ranked societies. We can look at ethnicity and conflict in these societies as well. The African burial ground also in lower Manhattan um, was excavated in 1991 when a federal building encountered a massive um, slave burial of Africans uh, in lower Manhattan. It resulted in um, mass protests by the descendant communities who wanted proper excavation and study, proper treatment of these individuals versus uh, the federal government who wanted to rush along the construction of their federal building down there. So um, the legislation of the United States kicked in. Um, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, um, which required consultation and um, a mitigation of what to do with what was a very important um, component of American history that had been um, underrepresented um, in archaeology. And so once again, we see how archaeology is often focused on giving voice to the voiceless um, or giving the, the place in history for people that have been um, forgotten or disenfranchised. So the protest and the excavation, the knowledge that was generated contributed to the construction of the Museum of African uh, and African American History in DC and also an interpretive center in the first floor of uh, that federal building which was ultimately constructed, uh, an interpretive center for the African burial ground in lower Manhattan and I encourage you all um, to visit um, the African Burial Ground and the Museum of DC. Provided extensive information about the social lives and status of slaves and what they went through, evidence of their resistance um, and of cultural revitalization um, 
through the material record, again, a cemetery where hundreds of burials were excavated and help us get insight into social hierarchy and rank societies. These were hot, hard fought and born out of uh, the fights of um, living people who were interested in having this story told. Um, it told of the trauma, the hard work of the lives of the slave classes in lower Manhattan and illustrated that this great city was built um, by slaves. If we try to understand gender and identity in prehistory, it can be difficult. There is a difference between the biological sex of an individual, uh, male or female biologically, and how they identify themselves in terms of gender. That distinction, um, while it may be easier to determine biological sex of a skeleton from prehistory, it, you can't um, very easily get at how that person identified their personality or the gender that they um, identified with when they were alive. So we can look at um, symbols of female power from the past. Here you can see a Neolithic vase from Romania um, and a Neolithic stone figure, female figure from Malta, uh, and then a Zapotec figure from Mexico that represent women um, in the past. And we can look all the way back to almost to 25,000 years ago, almost 30,000 years ago, when the Venus figurine uh, was popular among Paleolithic societies. This is the Venus of Willem Dwarf in Austria, which I was fortunate enough to visit recently. And I took this photo of very famous artifact. We'd, it's difficult for archaeologists to interpret the function, but we can say these Venus figurines were widespread across Europe and even went into Asia during the Paleolithic period. Um, we suspect they represent some form of fertility cult or worship, um, could represent the worship of females. It may represent a matriarchal hunter-gatherer society where descent lines are determined by the mother, and it re represents a period when there was greater egalitarianism between male and female relationships in the social hierarchy of the time. So uh, it also represents the emergence of very early forms of portable art and symbolism. Um, so important artifacts and representations of women and their power in past societies. I want to thank everybody for their attention and um, credit the images I've used in this presentation and thank you for your attention.